It was the longest of long shots, a low-budget boxing film with an unknown star. You're less than nothing. Nobody knew who Sylvester Stallone was. You <laughs> heard completely nobody. The script was written in just a few days. I couldn't believe it. Really quite stunning and tender and remarkable. Against the odds, it became a hit. I think anybody who read that script said it's a boxing movie, you can't make money. It even won Oscars and spawned a six-part film franchise. I don't think anybody expected it to be what it turned out to be, which is a film for the ages. Amazing. That's a victory for every little guy out there. That's all he wanted to do is go the distance. Rocky wasn't just a hero. He was an icon, a symbol of heart and hope. An everyman who inspired millions around the world. I was outside of Rome, and this one kid, he goes, mountain of muscles, mountain of muscles. It's this symbolism of never give up and, and that your dreams can't come true. Behind the scenes, the making of Rocky and its sequels was as unpredictable and tumultuous as the films themselves. Rocky's hero and creator were one and the same, Sylvester Stallone, an actor and writer who brought to life his fictional alter ego. Both would take a beating along the way. There was a tour de force of hospital visits. I mean, Jesus, it was named the wing after me. There doesn't seem to be any line between Stallone as an actor and Rocky the character. As much as I like to say, well, Rocky the character, it's me. As Rocky became a series, both the star and the boxer took on tough odds and tougher foes. From the sequel... It's Apollo. Who'd you expect? I was hoping it wouldn't show. Ha! to his opponents in Rocky 3, 4, and 5. I am rank number one. One! I'll fight him anywhere, anytime, for nothing. Get your hands up, man. You need an interpreter? It's time to go to school. You're gonna lose. I'm not gonna knock you out this time. I'm gonna put you through the street. Three decades after the original film came Rocky Balboa. During those 30 years, Rocky and Stallone would rise and fall and rise again. Stallone's life story parallels Rocky. This is really him. He's had lots of ups and downs, but you can never count him out. Making over a billion dollars, it's one of the most successful film franchises ever. But Rocky was never a sure thing. And despite a string of successful sequels, the last film was almost as much of a struggle to get made as the first. A lot of work went into it. I mean, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It was not a cozy, comfy set. It was like doing the first one. Everything was going against it. This is a story of triumph and defeat, of taking blows and being knocked down, but getting up and fighting on. This is the story of the Rocky Saga. The year was 1976. The Ramones were playing their first gig. Two friends formed a tiny computer company they called Apple. And an amateur boxer was about to get the chance of a lifetime. This is the land of opportunity, right? So Apollo Creed on January 1st gives a local underdog fighter an opportunity. Everyone in the world sort of feels that they would at least have one up at bat to see if they can hit the ball or not in their life. When Rocky was released in 1976, it was a sensation. It didn't just charm audiences, it floored them with a knockout blow. Millions turned out to celebrate the gritty tale of an underdog's last stand. It was a time when the peanut farmer from Atlanta was gonna be president of the United States, that the little man, the pure man, had a right to be heard. We were really celebrating America, we all felt the freshness of the future. I really think it was a kind of folk tale, and Sylvester really was a folk hero. The Rocky story is a fairy tale. It's a great story, as, as good as, as boxing. In a strange sort of way, the Rocky saga is just a story about America with the backdrop of boxing. Over 30 years, three Oscars, six films, and a billion dollars, Rocky continued to connect with its audience. But for the star, the films were a struggle every step of the way. 
skirmishes that mirrored again and again the life of the hero, a small-time boxer called Rocky Balboa. Give up, you know that? Give up, Rocky is such a well-meaning and a good character. Like, there's no point where you think this guy's terrible or he clearly has deeper, darker issues. Rocky falls for shy, introverted Adrian. She reminded me of Laura in The Glass Menagerie. Tennessee Williams, this kind of woman of enormous shyness. Together, Rocky and Adrian make the movie more than just a boxing film. It's the tale of two misfits who find strength in one another. It is very much a love story, very, very much a love story, but it's a partnership. Adrian is the sister of Rocky's best and perhaps only friend, surly alcoholic Paulie. He's just one of several strong supporting characters. He is sort of, in a way, the negative reflection of what Rocky could be. You are able to see how a person from this neighborhood who does not find the same success that Rocky does could be very embittered and very unhappy. Times are running away from him, the life is running away from him, and uh, he strikes out at anything he can. Working as hired muscle for a loan shark, Rocky has been written off by everyone, including veteran trainer Mickey Goldmill. You know, I've been coming in for six years, and six years you've been sticking it to me. I want to know how come. You want to know? I want to know how! He's a character who looks like he could take out Rocky if he needed to because he's so angry all the time. Because you had the talent to become a good fighter, and instead of that, you became a leg breaker to some cheap second-rate loan shark. To live in? It's a waste of life. You got a used up, washed up trainer, manager like Mickey. You got a used up, beat up fighter like Rocky to come together. Then Rocky gets a chance to prove himself. He's given the opportunity to turn his life around when he's chosen to fight the heavyweight champ, Apollo Creed. He picked you, Rocky. It's the chance of a lifetime. You can't pass it by. Well, Apollo Creed seemed to me to be a compilation of Ali and all the great heavyweights at that time. This character was a showman, was a salesman, was pretty bombastic, very smart, articulate, but at the same time knew how to play the game. Against a champion of Creed's caliber, Rocky knows he's got no chance. Because all I want to do is go the distance. This is within my grasp. I can go the distance with the champ. I can't beat him. I can go the distance with life. With the support of Adrian and Mickey, Rocky puts his heart and soul into training for the fight. It's the underdog believing in what he's doing. Because he has the heart. It is that guy that, that is so resilient that's able to take the punches and take the hits, but you never stop. He has more heart and more determination than the other guy. He didn't have education, but he had dignity. The Rocky philosophy is that people want to be the champion in their own life. The audience identifies with Rocky the other guy is bigger, faster, punches more powerfully, and so he's the underdog. If Rocky's story is a long shot, it's even more incredible that the film itself ever got made. The handwritten script from a little-known actor was somehow destined for glory. Sylvester Stallone certainly knew the life of an underdog. I wasn't very good in school, and I dropped out of school. I worked in the dock area. I drove forklifts, and I understood the mentality of the real-life Rocky. The product of a broken home in Hell's Kitchen and kicked out of a series of schools, the wannabe actor left New York to try to make it in Hollywood. But it wasn't easy. He was born with kind of a droopy draw and not a perfect way of speaking. Stallone scored a few small roles, from Death Race 2000 to The Lords of Flatbush. But with his wife pregnant, his car broken down, and just $106 to his name, his prospects were bleak. I had to sell my dog. I didn't even have money to feed the damn dog. This is a guy who had nothing. I mean, he really had, he didn't have two nickels to rub together. He also had painted his apartment black. That's how he was living. That was his state of mind at that point in time. At that time, I was looking for some sort of break in the business, and nothing was happening I was being characterizes dark types, the mugger, the, the thug. And I thought, well, why don't I take that image and try to write something about the soul of a person underneath the rough exterior? Stallone went to see a fight between Muhammad Ali and a local brawler dubbed the Bayon Bleeder, a 30-to-1 underdog. 
And what I saw was pretty extraordinary. I saw a man they called the Bayonne Bleeder, who didn't have a chance at all against, you know, the greatest fighting machine, supposedly, that ever lived. Body back, slips a punch to his left. Oh! And for one brief moment, this supposed stumble bump turned out to be magnificent in the fact that he lasted and knocked the champion down. I was a big fan of Rocky Marciano. Then I saw a few fights on TV, which triggered the idea, wow, why don't I play this down and out so-called bum fighter with a name like Rocky and see if that could be a perfect translator for somebody who's never really gotten a break. So out of total abject failure and everything I did in my life, I thought, hmm, if I could put this on the page, maybe other people identify with it. Stallone scratched out a screenplay by hand in just three and a half days. But in taking the idea from the page to the screen, the unknown actor would find there were no guarantees in Hollywood. Then they put in all these clauses. Okay, we'll give you a chance. The movie's gonna cost under a million dollars. You got 25 days to film it. And if you do anything wrong, if you breathe wrong, if you smoke with the wrong hand, if you do anything, you know, if you drop your fork when you're eating, any excuse for getting rid of you. In 1975, with his career going nowhere, unemployed actor Sylvester Stallone decided to create a dream role for himself, a down-and-out boxer called Rocky Balboa. The Rocky saga began when Stallone met producers Robert Chartoff and Erwin Winkler. Bob Chartoff and I had a deal at United Artists. I was auditioning for acting jobs that were very far and few between. So he came into the office. He was such a fascinating guy, so interesting, so funny, so bright. As he was leaving the room, with his hand on the knob to the door, he said to me, you know, Mr. Chartoff? I do a little writing, too, and I went, oh, OK. Well, if you have anything, just bring it by. We were kind of surprised because he came in as an actor, and we didn't think of him much as a writer and didn't know of anything about it. He must have had about eight scripts in his trunk. He sent us a script, I think it was called Paradise Alley, and we liked the writing a lot, but didn't particularly want to make that uh, story. So he said, I have this other story that if I write it, would you guys promise you'll read it? I said, I got a strike from the iron is hot, so I knocked out a script. It just went very quickly, run in like three and a half days. Three, four days went by, and he came back with 80 pages. Winkler and Chartoff loved the script. After some rewrites, they told United Artists they wanted to make it. I was lucky enough to get a copy of the script and read it on a plane, actually, coming back from New York, and uh, recommended it to our guys to do. The studio was happy with the script, but not so keen on the unknown actor. They said, this is great, OK, fine, thank you very much, and leave. I said, no, no, I, I have to do this because this is really my story. It's my autobiography, and I'll never get a chance like this ever again. You know, it's like building or tailoring a suit for yourself. It fits you, and you're never going to find that off the rack in your life again. You know, it's just going to never happen. I just said, you know, this is it. I have to go for broke. Stallone insisted that he play the washed-up fighter. He refused to sell the script unless he got the starring role. The script was brilliant. And everybody that read the script loved the script. We had confidence in the script more than him. We just really, really loved the script. And so we said, why not? We'll take a chance. Can you imagine then putting your bet down on someone by the name of Sylvester Stallone if you never saw him or heard of him? It just was, from the point of view of United Artists, a big gamble. That was just through sheer bullheadedness and naivete. I didn't realize how really hard it is to make a living in this business at a point. He wasn't your standard-looking leading guy. He was kind of muscular. He slurred a little bit. You know, we've got to talk like that. The execs at United Artists weren't sure they wanted to make an expensive boxing film starring a complete unknown. I can't remember the exact number, but I think it came in originally at two and a half or thereabouts. We thought that was too expensive. When the producers knocked the budget down to under a million dollars, it gave them the right to cast anyone they wanted. You've got to go with your instincts. This was a fascinating, intelligent, funny guy who looked like a street kid, and yet he went to school in Switzerland, who had stories to tell and ideas to express that I found very interesting and worth pursuing. Executives Arthur Krim, Robert Benjamin, and Eric Pleskow decided to watch The Lords of Flatbush before greenlighting Rocky and Stallone. As Eric tells the story, he ran the film. Arthur, at walking out, kind of liked the film and said, you know, it's strange, that guy's blonde. And Eric said to him, 
What's wrong with that? He said, you know, Northern Italy, they have a lot of blondes. Italians have blondes, too. They thought Stallone was Perry King. So they bought the picture thinking that Perry King was Rocky. Of the three who were there, Henry Winkler, Stallone, and Perry King, he's the only one that looked like a star who could carry a picture. Their mistake opened the door for the entire Rocky saga. With the lead actor in place, the film now needed a director. A script was passed to John Avildsen, who directed Save the Tiger. An old friend of mine, Gene Kirkwood, told me about Rocky, said it was about this box, and I said, boxing, not for me, I'm not interested in boxing. Well, second or third page, the guy's talking to his turtles, Cuff and Link. Oh, the, the, the domestic turtles. The, the one on the top is Cuff and the other guy is Link. <laughs> They make good soup. <laughs> I was charmed. I thought it was uh, a great character study and a love story. I didn't think it was about boxing any more than Gone with the Wind was about the Civil War. He had just made a picture called Joe, which was a low-budget movie that both Irwin and I liked very much. John was the right guy. He was very character-driven, and Rocky is a character-driven movie. With the director on board, the producers faced another big challenge. The issue really was on casting, who would be in the movie. Finding the right actor to play the heavyweight champion Apollo Creed would prove particularly difficult. We wanted a real boxer, I wanted a Ken Norton, and then he came in, he was just, he was huge at the time. You knew he was big when you could see his veins through his shirt. Another boxer they considered was former world heavyweight champion Joe Frazier. He got in the ring with me, and we started to move around. And truthfully, in 11 seconds, I had four stitches, clash of heads. I went, this is not going to work. I need someone not as proficient at smashing skulls. The search continued. Dozens auditioned, including a former American football player. We had been through everybody. Then finally, Carl Weathers walks in, like 10 o'clock at night. I walked in at the end of a Friday, as I remember, in typical Hollywood cattle call and I was introduced to the producers. He's all full of bluster and yeah, talking like that. Uh, here, here, uh, okay, uh, where am I supposed to sit? And I was introduced to the writer. And I'm sitting back behind the desk just watching this whole thing, and he's reading the lines, and I'm reading back with them, the directors over there. At the end of that, the writer was seated. I was standing. And then at the very end, he goes, I'd do much better if I had a real actor with me, so uh, who's playing Rocky? Because <laughs> he is <laughs> guilty. And the writer, as it turns out, was also the star of the movie, Sylvester Stallone. And I said, we got to hire this guy. I mean, he's the most arrogant, pompous, incredibly gifted, beautiful. I mean, as the character, it's perfect. For Weathers, the key to playing Apollo was working out how to create the right adversary for Rocky. The job for me was, how can I make him an antagonist without making him a villain? How do I find the humanity in this man? That's what my job is, regardless of whether he's supposed to be the good guy or the bad guy. You dislike him because of what he's saying, but you like him because of how smart he is. He's working it. He knows exactly how far to push him. The role made Carl Weathers an overnight sensation, and his character lasted all the way through to Rocky IV. Apollo Creed became a part of the landscape. Meanwhile, Stallone and the producers knew exactly who they wanted for Mickey the Trainer. I had written it for Lee J. Cobb, who I thought was brilliant and on the waterfront, and he had the part. And then the director goes, OK, uh, let's turn to page 16 and read. He goes, excuse me. I had Lee J. Cobb come in for the Mickey role and asked him to read, and he became very indignant that he didn't read. He goes, I've done about 60 movies. John said, yeah, you buy a Rolls Royce, you still want to drive it around the block. <laughs> because the last time I read was for a radio show in 1936. So if you want a disc jockey, you should hire one. I don't read. He looked at Sly, and he said, if I could write like you, I never would have been an actor. And he walked out. Even though I lost a great Lee J. Cobb, Lee Strasberg, Lou Ayers, and all these great characters, Broderick Crawford, but then in walked Burgess and Pingo. He had no problem with uh, auditioning. He came in and we read the scene where Rocky's thrown out of his locker and he comes and complains to Mickey. First time we meet Mickey. Came to the end of the scene and as Rocky turns to walk away, Burgess says, hey, Rock, that's not in the script. Sylvester said, yeah? He said, hey, you ever thought about retiring? And, and Sylvester said, no. Think about it. I said, great, that's perfect. You got the part. That's just what he would say. 
The role of Paulie went to a hard-working character actor who'd worked with the producers before. Very young dog was in a movie for us called The Gambler. Actually, it was supposed to be a girl. Adrian had a mother, had a Jewish mother, had to change the Jewish mother to an Italian brother who worked in a meat house. Talk about a rewrite. That's a rewrite. Just seemed to be the right guy. He was now part, more or less part of our stable, and it seemed like a wonderful part for him to play. I was in a commissary in MGM, and all of a sudden this big kid comes. He says, Mr. Young, I'm Sylvester Stallone. I wrote that Rocky. I said, oh, you did good, kid. That's beautiful, that's wonderful. He was very, very unique in the way he walked, and you could see that he had all this strife in his life, just an unhappy dude, which is what Paulie is, and he represents that guy that's always been left behind. The key role was Rocky's love interest. The casting of Adrian, it was a real odyssey. Originally, it was Susan Sarandon, and then we thought, well, maybe she's too sexy at the time. And then it went to Cher. And I thought, That'd be kind of interesting, Bette Midler. Carrie Snodgrass had come in and auditioned very well, and we had decided she could have the part, but her agent wanted too much money. I wanted her badly. I said, here, take my entire $360, you know, take my whole salary. It was uh, back to the drawing board. Just days before the cameras rolled, the part of Adrian was still not cast. So at the last second, we're desperate, and in walks Talia. Talia came in, and thank God for Carrie Snodgrass's agent, because Talia brought the character to life. She was just fantastic. I cannot audition. It's been my downfall. But there was something there. She walked in, and I looked at her and went, bingo. She just had the look, the eyes. She read the lines, and she was the person. There was not even a maybe. I got the job. <laughs> what Talia Shire brings to Adrian is a real understatedness. Her characterization is, in a way, key to the humanity of Rocky. The casting was over, but the difficulties were just beginning. As the filmmakers moved into production, they started to discover how hard it would be to make Rocky as a low-budget movie. I always used to feel we got the food and the lunches that were left over from New York, New York. <laughs> you know, we were kind of dealing with our own clothes and our own costumes. Those clothes that you see were from my closet, you know, some of them, and I still have them. You know, it, it was a do-it-yourself film. It was really like a gypsy company. We had one motor home that we catered in, the wardrobe, and then the bathroom was at the way back. Nearly my introduction to Stallone was walking into that motor home in the freezing cold. And I said to him, does the bathroom work? And he said, yeah, don't sling any iron in there. You'll be all right. You know what I mean? Because of the lack of cash, the crew had to move quickly. The entire film had to be shot in less than a month. When you have a budget of a million dollars, you have no time to waste. I believe there was even one day there, we did 60-some setups in one day. And that was like, it was going like that. We didn't repeat a lot of takes. There was little margin for error. But sometimes, the limited budget became an advantage. The lack of money caused a lot of good things to happen. We hadn't shot Rocky and Adrian's first date yet, which was about six or seven pages of yakking. And it took place in a cafe. And I had suggested to them that would really be the kiss of death. We decided that we'd take them ice skating. We're going to have a bunch of extras populating the rink. So well, we can't afford all the extras for the ice skating rink. And I said, what? if the place is closed. That's why there are no people there. And they convinced the attendant to let them go. Well, hey, I want you to do me a favor. You can see she ain't feeling too good. So good. if you could let her on the ice, I'd appreciate it. Only for a few minutes. 10 minutes, 10 bucks. I think the scene is much more romantic and unique and has a lot more charm than if there are a bunch of people bumping into each other in the background. Two lost souls, alone in an empty rink, barely holding each other up. It would become the perfect metaphor for their relationship. Good. You like the way I skate? Despite the small budget, this kind of authenticity was crucial to Stallone and Avildsen. It was why they wanted to shoot on location. It needed a town that was also an underdog town. Philly was real. It was all still real and unseen. Imagine Rocky not being filmed in Philadelphia. It would have been a, a total schlocko movie. First of all, we needed to cut corners on the film. And we thought it might be easier to do if we're out of the jurisdiction of uh, various organizations. The idea was to film in Philadelphia as long as we could 
until the unions found out about it. We were a very, very small group in Philadelphia, and I don't know if we ever would have been caught. Lloyd Kaufman, who was the production manager on the job, made all sorts of stuff happen, and it went very well. I had to do everything kind of quietly, because what if the Teamsters found out? I was like, no, I don't want to know. I don't know nothing. Don't break my legs. Production began in November 1975. It was the first day of shooting a rocket in Philly. They were looking at a camera shot, and he got down on the ground. And he was looking up. He took a, a sigh. Now he has to do it. He goes, this is it. If I don't do it, it'll never happen again. Stallone hadn't realized what he was letting himself in for. Almost immediately on location, a small training montage took on a life of its own. There was just a few things in there, punching the bag and hitting the heavy bag and jumping rope. I went, that's it? <laughs> like, whoops. I said, wow, why don't we use Philadelphia? The little montage became an epic series of shots around the city and one of Rocky's signature moments. We did scores of them running around chasing Stallone as he worked out in pre-dawn, you know, up Broad Street, across the railroad tracks, past the old ship, the Moshalu. We ran for miles everywhere, up and down hills, and none of that is choreographed. We see, hey, that's interesting. You're in the middle of Philadelphia as a sailing ship. Just jump out and run. OK, fine. And when you look at that shot of him running alongside the ship, he is fast. I mean, he put on a burst of speed there. We're in a van, looking at the side of a van. And can I say, holy That's what the driver said when he saw this. <laughs> it was good. Sylvester was in great shape, and he was very athletic. He, you know, didn't mind running around a lot. As athletic as Stallone was, what really elevated the training sequence was the iconic music. Music that almost didn't get made. A minuscule budget meant several established composers turned down the project. They turned it down because it was a $25,000 package deal. The whole budget was like under a million bucks, about $950,000. The music budget was $25,000, all in. $25,000 for everything. You pay for the musicians, the studio, the tape, the parking lot attendant, everything. And you get to keep whatever's left. Bad as it was, it was a deal young composer Bill Conti couldn't refuse. He worked fast, with some real creativity when it came to making ends meet. The way you make it worthwhile is that when the director says, well, are we going to see the movie? I says, I'm so sorry. I couldn't afford a projector and a projectionist. So no, we're not going to see the movie. And then to the musicians, when we said, how are we going to rehearse this? All right, you ready? Take one. Can we hear it back? No, it was very good. Let's move on. So in three hours, we did all of uh, Rocky. With so much on the line, it was a valuable three hours. I'm supposed to make you think, even though I know the end of the movie, that he has a shot. Everyone in the audience has got to think, this guy might have a shot at it. So it's the emotion, and if I get it, you get it emotionally. If I fail, then you don't. I think the combination of the training footage with Bill Conti's score cannot be overestimated in terms of connecting the audience with this underdog story and really giving a, a huge cinematic quality. So I did about a minute. I had done da 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 and da 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 in a faster kind of way. I said, you got to make it a little bit longer. He says, man, I need another 30 seconds. I shot about five miles of slide doing one on push ups and medicine balls. Could I have another 30 seconds? So it kept growing and growing. By the end, of course, it ended up being what it is. It sounded great. I said, you know, you ought to put some lyrics to this thing. This sounds like a song. We had lyricists on the project. And John says, well, can't we say something? I says, well, we've hired two lyricists. You can say anything you want. So we thought, oh, OK, and that's how Gonna Fly Now came to be. One final ingredient was needed to lift the training sequence off the ground a cutting-edge new piece of equipment invented by cameraman Garrett Brown. When we shot that in Philly, all the running around, there wasn't a name for it. It was quite a contraption with a little tiny green screen, all sorts of wires and things hanging off it. It looked like a monster, a beast. It had all these uh, washers and nuts and bolts and ropes hanging from it to create the balance. It looked like a, a crowbar with a can. It was, it was savage looking, heavy, loud but mobile. It became known as the Steadicam, and it revolutionized the way moving camera shots were made. 
I had a magic carpet for the camera, you might say. I mean, I had a one-of-a-kind machine that would let you run and climb stairs and, and so on, and do all the things you could never do handheld, and it, and it looked like a dolly shot. Prior to Brown's creation, getting smooth camera moves over distance required lots of time and money, which Rocky didn't have. In a world ruled by dollies, you laid rails outdoors. You either were on a crane and armed out, or you saw the rails. I think people in the business were more startled by it than the average audience, but I think the audience got into it for what it was, which was kinetically joyous. The Steadicam not only enabled the crew to move quickly, it gave the film a unique look. First of all, technologically, what you could do with that relative to a large camera that you've got to put on a dolly or handheld that's, you know, going to be sort of shaky shots. So it was just a, a phenomenal tool. I did the meat locker sequence, which is still one of my favorites. You know? All, you know, technically impossible stuff. No dolly could possibly have woven through those big sides of beef. Everywhere I would go, we'd jump out of the car. Gary would come out, and he was 6'6", six, six, and he was at one with this camera. Think of the shot in the Italian market where he's running up the street. I was sitting in a pickup truck taking out the bumps from that vile road with this thing. And that was the first usage of Steadicam, or, or early usage of Steadicam. John Avelson always wanted to be on the cutting edge of technology. On the emotional level, I do think that the, the nature of those shots contributed to people's feelings about the movie. Rocky was a startlingly good idea and startlingly new. And Rocky would have been a great film with or without the Steadicam. But I think that I helped it a lot. Without the Steadicam, one key image would never have been created. So Garrett, and this is where magic happens, only he, because of his great size and strength and knowledge, can fly up those steps as fast as I am. I mean, he's running sideways without looking at his feet. He's looking through a monitor. He went up to the top, and then we started going around, and, and I was just dancing. We didn't plan on it. And he's circling and circling and circling, and his, and his coverage is extraordinary. And then that became the shot of the movie, period, of my life. That's the image I'll always be remembered for. And we grabbed it. There was nothing planned. It was meant to be. With just a week in Philadelphia and another three weeks in LA, the production needed every extra second the Steadicam gave them. That's the thing about the first Rocky. It was just a spirit of cooperation. Everyone was helping out in whatever way they could. But as time pressures began to mount, tensions did too. I said, I'd like to have Carl Weathers come out of the corner and throw four right hands right away. And the man became outraged, the stunt coordinator. He goes, won't happen. I go, why? He goes, I refuse. And he quits. He quits. I went, oh. With filming underway, Sylvester Stallone and director John Avildsen knew that one thing would make or break their boxing movie, the fight scenes. But there was a problem. Neither Stallone nor his co-star Carl Weathers knew how to box. And I asked Carl, after he met with Sylvester and, and uh, Irwin and everybody, I said, have, do you have any boxing? And of course I had. Oh, yeah, I got, I got all kinds of things. I was an actor. You always lie and say yes, you know? Have you ever jumped out of uh, an F-14? Yes, of course I have. And I said, well, look, just show up tomorrow morning, and I wanna, I'm going to let you move around with one of my kids at Santa Monica. Jimmy took me to this little gym, and he wore me out in about a minute. After the first round, he was exhausted. I mean, I literally could hardly pick my arms up after three minutes. He couldn't even throw a punch. You burn so much energy when you don't know what you're doing. But at the end of it, they said, yeah, I think this guy can do it. Lo and behold, uh, we managed to pull it off. And Carl, being such a great athlete, really helped. And he really learned, he, you know? Getting in the ring every day and just trying to learn to box. I mean, really box, you know? I remember Sylvester and, and I both just really spending a lot of time at it, actually having a lot of fun, but being drenched through the process, you know, because it was work. It was really, really, really hard work. To complicate matters, director Avildsen had decided the boxing needed to have a fresh new look. Once I got the job, I thought I should look at some boxing movies, and I did. And I was appalled at how crummy the boxing looked. They knew they had to do something different. 
Hiring an experienced boxing coach to stage the fights seemed a good place to start. I was working with an old-time boxing coach, and I realized I've seen this fight before, and like the champion, and the harder they fall, and the John Garfield, and it's this one, two, slap, 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 slap. Two guys are going down, and two are going up, and two are going down. I said, come on. And I'm watching, I said, look at this footage here of Rocky Marciano fighting Joe Lewis. Why can't we do that here? And I said, oh, you don't understand. He was a, a boxing guy, but he was also a fencer. He used to teach fencing in movies and stuff like that. And I said, OK, let's just try it. I'd like to have Carl Weathers come out of the corner and throw four right hands right away. And the man became outraged, the stunt coordinator. He goes, won't happen. I go, why? Because it's just people don't throw four right hands. I said, I know he does because he's Apollo Creed. That's what makes him different from you and me. He goes, I refuse, and he quits. He quits, I went, oh. So now they're looking at me like I'm really arrogant. Like, what do you know? And you just had the best guy, his name was Paul, so I want to say. Paul Stater and George Wilbur, they were authorities in boxing as far as the film industry is concerned, but not as far as I was concerned. And he quit, and he had done every big boxing film there was. Oh boy, this is not happening at all. He was like a, a traditional type of stunt guy, and that's why that didn't work. So I thought, why don't we write it down? You learn dialogue, why can't you learn physical dialogue? Why can't you learn body language? And I said, Sylvester, why don't you go home and write this thing out? Lefts, rights, this guy gets down, the other guy gets up, whatever you want, write it out, and we'll, we'll learn that like a ballet. We choreographed the entire fight. You had to really work this thing out because you're, you're now not only learning to do this and do this well, but you're doing it for camera and you're doing it to look right. The movie maker is interested in keeping the audience's attention. And the audience doesn't want to see someone circling the ring for three minutes. They want to see some action. They want to see punching. <laughs> For cameraman Garrett Brown and others on the production team, shooting the fight was as demanding as training for it. I was encouraged to be in the ring. I would be circling, they'd be circling. They don't typically do this in the center of the ring. They, they do crisscrosses and approach the ropes. Some of the time I'd be dancing out of the way. There are some stills of me in the background when I have a look on my face like this. I'm looking like this, like I'm watching people getting hurt, like a spectator of an actual fight. When you're shooting a fight film, it's, it's harder than fighting a fight because you're doing it for 12 to 14 hours. And you have to have the same energy from the first round to the last take of the day. They kept up the pace and wrapped in just 28 days. No, it's good. It was just that quick. And it was wrapped, and we edited the film. The next hurdle was getting the film into cinemas. UA did not want to release the film that year because UA had network and had Bound for Glory. The president of MGM uh, at the time sent me a letter after he saw the film, and he said, I want to remind you that we still have the right to sell the film directly to television and not give it a theatrical release. When Rocky was released in November 1976, it was still a long shot. How would a mass audience react to a movie about a boxer who doesn't win? I thought it was going to end up in the bottom half of a double bill in a drive-in in Alabama or something. We didn't open the movie to a lot of theaters. I remember, you know, Philadelphia and a few other places. I got a copy of the New York Times, which had this terrible, terrible review. First review that came out was Vincent Canby, a bomb. Thumbs down. He hated the movie. I was standing in front of the theater, uh, where it was playing and reading this review, and it was really uh, devastating. And out of the theater comes Peter Falk, and he said, hey, congratulations. Uh, it, the picture's just great. And I said, Peter, look at this terrible review in the New York Times. And he said, Irwin, don't look at the review. Just go inside and see. They were cheering and jumping up and down. And I said, wow, I've never, I've never. It was amazing. It was bigger than all of us. What, what happened as an event. I don't think anybody could envision that. I certainly couldn't have, you know? When's the last time you saw a movie where people are standing up cheering, where grown men are crying? That's when I realized we had made it. This, this is, I'm, I think I'm, I'm on my way. It wasn't until I saw the lines around the block in New York on Third Avenue when it was playing as Cinema 2 that it began to sink in that this thing might be a hit. 
We started with three theaters, and then we wound up with every theater in the world. The impact was immediate. We did good business, and it just grew and grew and grew. There was one moment, I remember walking down the street in New York. You just walked down like anybody else. The next morning, after the movie comes out, hot dog vendors are going, yo, Apollo. Honestly, it was a little scary in the very beginning, because it wasn't just, oh, hi. It was like they were all over you. It wouldn't be just one person. It would be person after person after person. That was kind of crazy. And then we started getting great, great critical response. We won the Golden Globe. We got the LA Film Critics co-best picture award that year with Network. Then in January 1977, the Oscar nominations came out. We got 10 nominations. It's a lot. We never imagined something like that would be the case. 10 Academy Award nominations? for a $900,000 movie that was really made for drive-ins. But Rocky faced stiff competition that included two other United Artist films. Those are the horses that they were betting on, was Network and Bound for Glory. We didn't come out until December, and they didn't assume that we'd have a shot at it. On Oscar night, the filmmakers felt like gate crushers. First of all, we were scared out of our minds. Of course, that's what happens when you know that there are going to be a couple of billion people watching this show. Nobody at that time could tell that this movie was going to win the Oscar. But that evening, Rocky won three Oscars and became the first sports film ever to win Best Picture. And I wouldn't be surprised that it might have been the, the lowest budget uh, movie to win Best Picture. Rocky's performance at the box office was just as impressive. It grossed over $117 million in America alone. You can tell from what the movie cost and what it grossed. It was absolutely amazing. All of a sudden, your wife is working as a secretary, and you're looking for work. And almost the next day, by 77, I'm conducting the Academy Award Orchestra, and I have film offers. Naturally, talk of a sequel began almost at once. The day we finished, I went to Gucci's. I bought a gold-plated pen, not a gold pen, but a gold-plated gold pen. I bought a leather-bound notebook, and I wrote on the first page, now write the sequel. I think we were all surprised over the success of the movie, and one of the producers said, when I said, well, are we going to do another one? She said, we will do them until they stop coming. But in addition to acting and writing, Stallone wanted to direct the sequel as well. It will be his next major challenge. That's a sleepless job, because you're writing, you're directing, and you're acting, and they're starring in it. That's a pretty big load. In 1976, a low-budget film about an underdog boxer made its star and writer, Sylvester Stallone, into an overnight sensation. My God, I made it. I made it, Ma. Top of the world. All of a sudden, it was like, boom. There wasn't anywhere we could go after Rocky came out that people weren't screaming and yelling for him and following him. It was a phenomenon. Everybody was talking about it. It was the movie of the year, to say the least. And of course, they're going to make a sequel. The studio at this point was very anxious to make another Rocky. We were very anxious to make a movie called Raging Bull. The studio didn't want to make Raging Bull at all. And we kind of waved the flag of Rocky II in their face to get them to be a little bit more forthcoming about Raging Bull. I dare say if not for Rocky, there'd never be a Raging Bull. After Rocky's success, Stallone and his manager wanted a bigger paycheck. Jeff Wald at that point was his manager. And I remember him walking into my office and saying, OK, we want to do another Rocky. We want a million dollars and 5% of the gross. I want them to readjust his points. I said, Jeff, just leave my office. He was so mad at me when he said, I'll put my cigar out on your face. You know, if you can't find the door, I'll just open it for you. I didn't take it personally, by the way. At the time, a million dollars was a lot of money. Well, on the first movie, he'd only gotten $75,000 to do the movie, which included script, acting, the whole deal. I thought going from 75 to a million was a little bit of a stretch. This negotiation went on for months and months and months. But when the heads of United Artists left to form their own company, Orion Pictures, the new management finally struck a deal for Rocky II. I think he got more than a million after we left, so it all turned out well. They agreed to a reorganization on the points. Sly really got rich off that. With the money agreed, there was still one major sticking point. Director John Avildsen was not available. And he had asked me to do Rocky II, but I had uh, 
got involved in another picture and said no. I think people expected John Avildsen to be the director of Rocky II. Avildsen was busy on pre-production for Saturday Night Fever, so Stallone decided he wanted to direct it himself. But he had limited experience. And they said, no way, what does he know about directing? Stallone had tried his hand at directing on Paradise Alley, which had bombed. Everyone always thought that Stallone was in over his head. He was used to that from when he was a kid. Ah, he's a hoodlum, he can't do anything. But producers Chartoff and Winkler knew how essential Stallone had been in the making of the first Rocky. He was involved with every aspect of the film. That's why we had no problem with the thought of him directing the second one. So they struck a deal. Stallone would direct Rocky II. Reprising their roles in the sequel were Carl Weathers as Apollo Creed, Talia Shire as Adrian, Burt Young as Paulie, and Tony Burton as Apollo's trainer, Duke. As writer, star, and now director, Stallone had his hands full. That's a sleepless job, you know? That really is, because you're writing, you're directing, and you're acting in this, starring in it. That's a pretty big load. Even before filming started, there were problems. While training on a bench press, Stallone ripped a muscle, requiring a change in the script. I tore my chest where I had to have it connected with a piece of nylon, so it, it's, it literally cut a window on the bone and they stitched the pec back up. That's why I always had these veins coming across afterwards. That's why in Rocky too, the whole movie is you're gonna fight right-handed, right hand, because right I couldn't use his hand. That's switching out a southpaw anyway, will you? No tricks, say switching. And he goes, in the last round, you're gonna switch up and catch him off guard, which is, of course, a little far-fetched, but the reason was either cancel the film or do this whole other sort of style. So I, you know what? Again, another disastrous occurrence, but it turned out to be great for the film. With a budget of $7 million, Rocky II was bigger in every way. More sets, more extras, and much higher expectations. When we did Rocky II, there were nine trumpets, nine trombones. The orchestra was huge. I had more porta potties so with a bigger budget. That was good. We only had one on Rocky I. Barely that, even. By the time the second one came out, we had a full auditorium. So now you can start to shoot from above and really show the crowd, which is important. The fight in Rocky II is, I think, vastly superior than the first one. The script, as you recall, had to be different on two than one because he wasn't an anonymous, you know, low-ball guy, you know, anymore. Swarms of people were chasing him. Creating a second story that would satisfy Rocky fans was the biggest challenge for Stallone. The pressure was on. Unlike the first Rocky where there's sort of an upward trajectory, the majority of Rocky II is a downward trajectory. You're sort of watching him going, what are you doing? The sequel begins moments after the end of Rocky. Apollo, feeling his win should have been more decisive, challenges the boxer to a rematch. Any place, any time. Rocky, a rematch. Rocky accepts Apollo's challenge and throws himself into training. For Stallone, working hard as lead actor and director, there was a striking parallel between himself and his character. Just like Rocky, Stallone was driven to prove that he wasn't a one-hit wonder. The epic finale drove home the truth that neither Rocky nor Stallone were down and out anymore. But one aspect of the ending posed a huge challenge for the new director. The idea that he wins the second one, we had some problems there because at that time, Talia Shire was tied into another movie. Stallone couldn't film Rocky and Adrian together for the big scene. He had to film her separately months later and hope for the best. That's why she's at home watching it. But again, it worked, it worked out great because at the very end of the fight, when Rocky goes, you're Adrian, I did it through the TV. Yo, Adrian! Adrian! <sighs> Even I get misty. <laughs> Rocky II went on to become the second highest grossing film of 1979, earning over $200 million worldwide. It was a TKO for Stallone. The fact that it, he was triumphant at the end of the movie only prompted people to want the next installments more, even more so than they wanted Rocky II. It was no wonder that Stallone became caught up in his own celebrity, living in the glare of the spotlight. So here's a guy who grew up, wasn't part of the mainstream. Suddenly everyone was telling him, you are the handsomest, most talented, sexiest guy on the planet. It's overwhelming to have that many people saying, you're great, yes, 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 to anything you wanted. 
When his other acting roles in Victory and Nighthawks didn't do well at the box office, Stallone decided to return for Rocky III in 1982. Rocky had transcended being a fighter. He was now a symbol. Drawing heavily on Stallone's own life, Rocky III is the story of a world heavyweight champion struggling with his newfound celebrity. Stallone said he saw the film as a kind of documentary. He had lost his edge. He was a little vain. He lost weight. He had his face fixed. He did everything to become more of a celebrity. He wasn't likable in the beginning of the movie. He was everything that you didn't want him to be. He had the Maserati, he had the mansion, he had the this, he had the that. Where in Rocky II, he was trying to do a commercial and he couldn't get through it without stumbling over his lines or, or fumbling the dialogue. Now he's advertising for American Express effortlessly and getting fitted for suits. And he's had a camel hair coat. I mean, he's loaded with money. His hair was too nice. He was coiffed, almost like with the coats and little pompous. I was like, boy, who, who are you? Now, what have you become? When you now have everything at your beck and call, and people start to protect you and separate you from your roots, and you lose your traction in reality. Rocky becomes bloated, and the success gets to him. And I think, to a large degree, the same thing happened to Sylvester Stallone. Fame and fortune threatened to destroy the underdog appeal that had made Stallone and Rocky so alluring. Sylvester Stallone, in particular, seemed to have kind of forgotten so many aspects of what made Rocky a compelling character. There's a kind of disassociation with your public. You start to change a little bit, not always for the best. I said, let me put that in Rocky Three. Maybe the best way of saying it is hubris, which brings a lot of people down. <laughs> we see it every day. It's maybe one of those flaws in us all that comes about as a result of certain amount of success and then sort of getting ahead of yourself. Stallone knew that a lot was riding on the casting of Rocky's next adversary. Surprisingly, he chose someone who was neither an actor nor a boxer, a man he'd spotted on America's toughest bouncer competition. Mr. T was Leon Spinks' bodyguard, and he was very flashy. He had the mohawk, had the earrings, and oh, hey, man. Mr. T's role as the fierce young boxer Clubber Lang was supposed to be a small part, but it kept growing. Mr. T. You know, had something. He had that charisma, that larger than life, that X factor, whatever it is that makes the camera like you and make and transfers your energy to the audience. I think that's very important. But getting the fast-talking, streetwise Mr. T to work with a professional film crew wasn't easy. Well, he kind of had a reputation for being tough, whether he was a guy from the streets or not. I don't know. He wasn't really at that point an actor. I didn't think he was much of a fighter, and he didn't act like much of a fighter. Stallone decided to make their first fight short and brutal. By the time we got into Mr. T, that's where it really became more difficult, because I said, let's cut it down to three rounds. So it had to have as many punches, if you follow a mathematic code, as last fight, which was successful. Now you can't shortchange people, but you got to jam in that many punches into three rounds as opposed to 15 rounds. The fight had to feel authentic. You wanted it to look like a fight. And that meant training. With Mr. T, that didn't work. Whatever kind of punch he wanted to throw, that's what he did. He never lifts. And one of those things where you have to maybe call him a couple times to get to the set because don't realize the importance of doing it. Although Sly was very good at getting people to do things. He had an urgency that he could look people in the eyes and they would understand. Despite his inexperience, Mr. T used his impressive persona to create a menacing foe. So, Club of Lang, what's your prediction for the fight? Pain. When they meet, Rocky suffers two of the biggest losses of his career at Club of Lang's hands, a sudden knockout and the death of his trainer, Mickey. We did it. We did it. We did it. When he died in the movie, uh, uh, I said, maybe I should have put him on life support. I hated to get rid of him, really. He didn't like going either. I could have kept him bedridden for another movie or so. After these losses, Rocky needs help. Enter former antagonist Apollo Creed. You gotta get that look back, Rock. Eye of the Tiger, man. Eye of the Tiger, come on. And eventually, he lost, quote, his Eye of the Tiger. A tiger is one mean animal. You throw that tiger in the ring with any other cat, and he will make mincemeat out of him. That means the killer instinct. I the tiger. I've been walking around with that saying in my mind since 1970. I just heard it somewhere. I said, I the tiger. 15 years later, I used it. 
After a pep talk from Adrian, Rocky is reinvigorated. Paolo thinks you can do it, so do I. But you, you gotta wanna do it for the right reasons. The training would make Rocky leaner than ever before, and Stallone too. He reportedly slimmed down to just 2.8% body fat. He risked to get so cut up in Rocky III, they actually got sick. You can't hold 3% body fat for that long. You go into cardiac arrest. Rocky finally manages to outbox Clubber Lang and reclaim his title. Rocky III seemed to have taken both Stallone and his hero to the limit, but it wouldn't be long before both were pushed even further. It was brutal. Let me tell you, those shots, I ended up in the hospital for five days. By the mid-1980s, the Rocky sequels had become an accepted and expected part of popular culture. Stallone had branched out into other films, from Rambo to Rhinestone, with mixed results. But a new Rocky sequel seemed like a sure thing. There was only one problem. How could he avoid telling the same story? How are you going to make Rocky again? How are you going to equal that character? And you're all wound up, and you're trying to, how can I top the last one? How can I top the last one? Stallone decided to set it against a Cold War backdrop of United States-Soviet tensions. Rocky IV would find the Italian stallion battling not just another boxer, but world politics, a superhero fighting on a global scale. Ford was a whole other animal. That was bombastic, is what that was. It happened with Joe Lewis when he fought Max Schmeling, but it was Nazis against, you know, the free world. Hmm. So I moved this situation and just made it Russia, Cold War. There's a sort of an interesting payoff to the really wonderful development of Apollo's character in Rocky 1 and 2. There is that moment in every athlete's life where you can't quite do what you used to do. You're just not as fast as you used to be. You're slowing down, dude. Again, it's a philosophical message or a pretty blatant message that don't keep beating your head against the wall and trying to compete against something that's more physical, more powerful, and more deadly than you are. Rocky tried to tell you, leave that Russian alone. This dude is a bad man. The bad man is a cold-hearted villain, Ivan Drago, the ultimate product of Soviet technology. To play him, Stallone found a diamond in the rough a Swedish student, model, and karate champion turned actor, Dolph Lundgren. I came to America to study chemical engineering at MIT in Boston. I got into acting, and you know, one of the first castings I went to was for some boxing movie. I came up to a table, and there's a girl sitting there with a bunch of papers, and it turned out to be Sasha Stallone, who was Sly's wife at the time. I didn't know that, but she just didn't even look up. She just said, how tall are you? So six four. She's like, too tall, next. And I was like, wait a second. Six months later, when I was in Europe, somebody called me on the phone, and he was out of breath, some PA from Paramount. Like, oh, thank God I found you. You know, Sly was going to kill me. I met Stallone at uh, Paramount, and he said, yeah, I saw your pictures. You know, you look good. And, and I told him I was a fighter and all this. And then he showed me all of these binders of, you know, eight by tens of other guys. There were like 5,000 guys up for the role. And I was like, oh. You know, I'll never get it. But Lundgren made the final cut and returned for a screen test, where he experienced the full force of the Rocky machine. There was about 50 people behind camera. You could kind of hardly see him back there. It was Sly, his bodyguards, and a bunch of guys in suits. And, and I was there, you know, knowing that, OK, <laughs> this is it. I did my monologue. You know, I decided to play the guy very kind of cold and, and collect it, not to move too much just to kind of play the interior, like a Soviet officer, because, you know, it has that stance with the high chin and everything. Two days later, Sly called me in New York. He got the role. With the villain cast, production began on the fourth Rocky movie. Where the original was low budget and no frills, this was a full-blown extravaganza. Four was as much fun as you could possibly have as an actor. Apollo is set to fight the Russian machine, and the build-up is pure Las Vegas glittering lights and dazzling costumes, showgirls and tuxedos. That was so insane. And I had so much fun with all that. And I'm down on the platform, and I rise up into the light, because it's kind of metaphorical for me of getting introduced to Hollywood. And, and also, I can see my face there. When I see myself, 27-year-old kid, actually reacting to being in this casino in Vegas, and Stallone, you know, Carl Weathers, James Brown, they're all in there. And I think the look of my face is, is priceless, because it's real. And there's no acting there. It's just a Swedish kid. 
becoming a movie star. The pageantry of the fight between Apollo and Drago was dramatic, but it was the ending that was a real knockout. Insisting his friend Rocky doesn't stop the match, Apollo is killed in the ring. It's not just a matter of him dying, it's a matter of a person who is so proud and unable to acknowledge his own limitations that he would put himself in a literally life-threatening situation in order to hopefully prove that he is still as good as he ever was. Thought, well, when Apollo goes down, number one, I don't want to catch myself because that gives it away. And then I was doing this little twitching you know, as I went down. And the doctor really thought I'd gotten taken out. He comes up running to me and, are you okay? Are you, did you, are you all right? You know, yeah, man. You know, he saw the twitching and he thought I'd been tagged, man. So it worked. It worked. If he dies, he dies. Ivan Drago wasn't uh, exactly known for his verbal abilities in the movie, but he could fight. To avenge his friend's death, the all-American Rocky comes out of retirement and travels to Russia for an unsanctioned bout with Drago. The fact that it, it had the whole Soviet thing going on, and the stakes were higher, and your patriotism was tested and so forth. Rocky IV makes a pretty interesting social statement about sort of the relationship between the USA and Russia at that time, which I think it very consciously was trying to make. Stallone wanted to take the film to a new level of boxing authenticity, even if it meant enduring a particularly brutal training and fighting regimen. I trained harder probably for that than I trained for the others because Dolph is so damn much bigger. I trained with Stallone for five months. We trained twice a day, uh, six days a week, weights in the morning and boxing in the afternoon. Usually I'd end up getting the worst of it. A lot of that happened in the training, during the training montages, running up those hills, slipping on the rocks a couple times. We almost took falls that I thought could have been fatal. I was surprised that Stallone, who was 10 years older than me at the time, well, still is, but he was about 35 and I was 25, that he actually was able to do that. Because, you know, for a 25-year-old fighter, 35 was like, forget it, you're over. You know, my, in my world, you were, by 30, it's over. So I was impressed by him, I remember. To make the boxing as realistic as possible, Stallone decided to film the first part of their fight with real sparring. Taking the storyline a little too close to reality, Lundgren delivered a near fatal blow to his director. That was the most hellacious. <sighs> that was brutal, let me tell you, those shots. He would tell me to hit him harder or, you know, more body shots, you know. Bolt hit him so hard, he moved his heart. I ended up in the hospital for five days. He hit me so hard in the heart that it was uh, my, it was called a periocardial sac that was starting to swell around my heart. And Dolph's an incredibly powerful guy, believe me, and, and powerful, yeah, it was just devastating. So next thing I know, I'm on a low altitude flight to St. John's Hospital and put on an in intensive care. He was a tough guy, but maybe I did hit him too hard, I don't know. But Stallone and Rocky survived to fight another day. Everybody should change. Ask me what it is, Milica. Lundgren felt his character change in that pivotal moment as well. In the Frankenstein myth, the monster turns on his creator. Sly had that in the script. He's kind of been used by the system and that he's feeling a bit bad about some of the things they make him do. And when he does turn on his creators, it comes from, from his inner pain of being manhandled and being brought up to be this perfect specimen. The message and the lavish production values won fans over and made Rocky IV the most successful film in the series. Stallone did a great job as a director. The fight scenes are very, very good, even when you look at him today. It's like he was at the top of his game. Rocky IV earned $300 million worldwide, making it, at the time, the highest grossing sports film ever made. With so much money at stake, it wasn't long before Rocky V was looming on the horizon. It seemed this franchise could do no wrong. But by 1990, Sylvester Stallone wasn't sure what to do with the character of Rocky. There's only so many bad guys you can come up against. Fought the Russians and you fought Mr. T. You had to keep thinking of new approaches. And the audience wasn't sure it still cared about the superhero boxer. Honestly, I think by 1990, audiences had just tired of, of Rock. I mean, he'd been around for almost 15 years. Stallone and his hero were both facing long odds at the start of Rocky V. Both were former champions, now well past their prime. Was anyone still in their corner? I think film fans felt burned on Rocky IV. 
had tired of Stallone to a degree. So they summarily rejected Rocky V. Rocky V was an attempt to reset the saga and return the character to his roots. His fortune gone, Rocky brings his family back to his old neighborhood. Unable to box due to injuries, Rocky takes on a young protege, Tommy Gunn, played by real-life boxer Tommy Morrison. So far we've had one, two, you've had Carl Weathers, three, you had Mr. T. He goes, I need something different, just to change it up a little bit, again. So I said, uh, man, I've been seeing this kid coming up on ESPN. This guy's like knocking dudes out straight. I mean, he can bang, good looking, handsome, blonde hair kid. Tommy Gunn later turns against his mentor and the two face off, not in a climactic boxing match, but in a vicious street brawl. I asked most people, the diehard Rocky fans, they go, why don't you like Rocky V? Because he didn't fight in it. It was a street fight. He didn't fight, you know, in the ring. That's what, a lot, that's what bothered a lot of people. He had fought in the ring four times. I thought this was a really good idea, fighting in the street. It was interesting, but I think it was anticlimactic compared to the other fights, and that was a mistake on my behalf. I thought it might have worked, but once I saw the fight, I went, mm, no, no, there's a certain kind of pageantry. The fight wasn't the only innovation. In an effort to recall the grittiness and magic of the original, Stallone and the producers brought back the Oscar-winning director from the very first Rocky. He wanted to recapture lightning and ball, and he hired John Avildsen. Avildsen had gone on to direct the popular Karate Kid trilogy, but he'd never again reached the dizzy heights of the first Rocky. Sly felt he just didn't want to work that hard. And so the natural guy to bring in was Avildsen. I think he just didn't want that much responsibility. I think he was very active at that point, making quite a few films, and didn't want to spend nine months of his life in a post-production editing room trying to figure out how to put the pieces together. It's a different time, it's a different vibe. You know, everyone's older, and the movie just didn't work. It just didn't work, and it was very disappointing. Time. By the time you get to a fifth film and you have him mentoring another boxer and trying to ease Rocky, much less audiences, sort of out of the world, the superheroic world of Rocky three and four, I think they had just tired of it. But Avildsen believes the film ran into problems for another reason. He loved Stallone's original script, which called for a risky and potentially powerful conclusion. It was going to end. At the end of that, Rocky dies. A beautiful scene. He takes this beating from Tommy Gunn and with his head in Adrian's lap, and he's gone. I thought this was going to be the end. I thought Rocky's going to die. It was incredibly depressing to write. In Hollywood, it's probably a bad idea to kill off a character that's as iconic as Rocky. He was going to go out that way in, a, in somewhat of a blaze of glory. He was going to die on the, on the steps of the museum. About two weeks in, the head of the studio calls, and he says, oh, by the way, Rocky doesn't die. I said, why not? He said, well, these people don't die. James Bond, Batman, Superman, they don't die. The studio got its way and kept Rocky alive. Avildsen believes this undermined the movie. When you took that away from the story of the guy dying, what, you're not going to go and see Rocky die? That's an event. But if he doesn't die, there's no event. It was like a shaggy dog story. It was very unsatisfying. Instead. Rocky wins the street fight against Tommy. The boxer survived, but Rocky V was a critical and financial casualty. The, the dilemma with Rocky V to a large degree is that he left the ring. Expected to be one of the big hits of 1990, Rocky V earned only $40 million in US box office sales. For Stallone, this came as a shock. He'd wanted to return the character of Rocky to his roots, but the actor himself was a long way from where he'd been in 1975. I just don't think he can go backwards. Some felt Stallone was distracted during filming. They wondered if he'd lost his passion for the role. Sylvester wasn't a starving actor anymore. He had a line of people waiting to sell him things, do things for him, and it was hard to find the time to shoot the movie. So it, it wasn't the same thing. And I've always told him, I said, every time you direct your own thing, it always works. Every time you try to bring someone else in because you want to go out and play golf, it doesn't work. I kind of think he thought the fifth one was the end of it completely, you know? And so he really didn't give his heart like he gave the other pieces. Whatever the reason, for its creators, its hero, and its audience, Rocky V was a low point.
I don't think anyone's ever been disappointed in a Rocky movie, other maybe than Rocky V. Rocky V was the inevitable downside. I just think the Rocky uh, V script wasn't as good as the others. I think some of those movies were made to get paid. Everybody grabbed for the money. And we all went our way with a couple of dollars. Clearly, like its hero, the franchise was not invincible. Given the critical and commercial failure of Rocky V, it looked as though the saga had come to an end. Sylvester Stallone would age another 16 years before he'd reunite with his alter ego, and Rocky Balboa would go one more round. So you're gonna drop dead in the ring. You know, you're not Rocky I, you were 29, 60. In the years following the disappointment of Rocky V, Sylvester Stallone stumbled through a series of hits and mostly misses. In 1999, he finally sat down to write a new Rocky script, the story of a retired boxer returning to the ring for one last bout. But no one was interested. I said, this is a good one. This is a really good one. And they said, no, never. Over our dead bodies. The last one was turned down twice. They didn't want to do another Rocky. For what, they, they didn't have a good relationship with him at the end. I was resistant. Uh, I, I didn't think that there was an audience out there to uh, do it. For more than six years, the studio refused to green light it. Nobody wanted to make it. We couldn't get any interest anywhere. United Artists would not make the picture. They felt it was a bad bet. It's incredible. After the movies probably made billions of dollars, people multi, multi, multi millionaires. When he wants to do the Rocky Balboa, no one wants to do it. In a way, Stallone and Rocky had come full circle. That was the hardest odyssey. You go back and you've been up and down and following a fifth sequel that was not successful from 1990. And here you are in 2006, 16 years later. Excuse me, the last thing you were doing was Spy Kids. What are you kidding me? I think he was down, down and counted out. And I think, again, clear example of the fact that you can't count him out. He says, Bert, I have a script that turned me down at MGM, but I want you to read the script. Tell me what you say would matter to me. So I read it. I called him up. I says, we must do it. It's beautiful. But it wasn't going to happen until Joe Roth of Revolution Studios got involved. Sly gave it to Joe Roth, who said he wanted to do it. And we all got together, and the negativity changed because of him. I gave him all the reasons why it shouldn't be done, and he gave me all the reasons why it should be done. So they were all right. I was dead wrong. When Stallone finally got the go-ahead, he was given a tiny budget, just like the early years. And even before filming began, the critics were mocking him, saying a geriatric Rocky smelled of career desperation. The critics who had, you know, one eye firmly raised and going, Rocky six, give me a break. My wife, she was borderline hysterical, actually. <laughs> she goes, oh, you'll make a fool of yourself. You're too old. But Stallone decided he would not only star in the film, he would direct it as well. If I'm going to go down in flames, I might as well be in the cockpit. From the start, Stallone decided to shake things up. The film begins with Rocky at Adrian's grave. I wrote about five drafts with her alive, and the son was in the Air Force. And Rocky goes, I want to fight again. And I went, wow, this is not that interesting. And I thought, if he's going to be devastated and back to less than zero, where the audience will be behind him and follow his drama, then the most precious thing is life has to be gone. Wait a minute. The movie opens and she's dead? The whole idea of having a fold-up chair hidden in a tree so you can sit there and talk to your wife. Because he had nobody. Now I had the basis for a film just in estrangement and loneliness and isolation in grief. In Rocky Balboa, an older Rocky, retired and widowed, is trying to find his place in a new world, running a restaurant and working to repair his relationship with his son, played by Milo Ventimiglia. When I come here, you don't feel so comfortable, and I, I certainly don't want to do that. It's where the, uh, the, the drama lies of, of these two characters. And of course, you know, having, having Adrian not around anymore and the heartbreak that Rocky has. He's alone. He doesn't have anybody. Everyone's going to have this fight someday in their life, this emotional battle. It's about loss, and it's about embracing the future when everything you love 
is gone. It's just his biggest fight of his life. When offered an exhibition match against champion Mason the Lion Dixon, Rocky agrees to fight. And I think it was also a metaphor for him. Yeah, hey, I'm not done yet. For Stallone, this comeback tale had personal meaning. The story of an older guy coming back in had resonance. It was about defining what age is and when somebody's finished or not finished. But neither Rocky nor Stallone knew what they were getting themselves into in the lead up to the fight against Mason Dixon, played by real life boxer Antonio Tava. The last one was, oh my God. So you're gonna drop dead in the ring. Rocky won, you were 29. You're 60 years old, you have a heart attack. I mean, they're doing like 30, 40 setups in the ring with Tarver. The pace and punishment were grueling. The last one, I cracked the vertebrae in my neck. I tore my Achilles tendon. The knee also had to be operated. I had to have a arthroscopic surgery. And we still had to fight. The whole training, I'm, I'm walking around with this boot. But it turned out I got in better shape doing that. Normally, because of just the strain of limping around like that, I said, gee, that, my legs are in great shape. I never had to, I should have broke my foot a long time ago. Every time there's a problem, it's good luck in Iraqi. Every time it's a perfect shoot, it ends up being rhinestone or something my mom was shoes. So, you know, keep that beatings coming, folks. Stallone decided that this was going to be his most authentic fight scene ever. I knew it was going to be the last Rocky, and I wanted it to be the most real. We had a real champion in there. And the punches by far in that are, there's more contact in that fight than all the fights put together. He had really gained a, a confident sense of how to shoot the fights according to what the demands of the franchise were. The fight was shot with real spectators seated for a real bout between boxers Bernard Hopkins and Jermaine Taylor. This is the truest of all the fights because at this point, HBO had become the template for how boxing is watched. It's mathematical. There is no secret to it. It's every fight is the same. And we switched to high def during the fight to change that whole mood. And the lighting becomes more flat and garish, which is exactly what you would see in a high def production. Somehow, Stallone and his alter ego, Rocky, once again defied the odds and went the distance. There were all kinds of stories about what a great shoot it was. He had had his run up the stairs and that had started to snow, big real flakes, supernaturally large snowflakes. I mean, what God shined on Sly to give him that scene. Again, Stallone found inspiration in a down at heels neighborhood, the place where it had all begun. It was pretty extraordinary. All the people are there, a little worn, a little different, like we all are. We'd be on the streets of Philly, and we'd kind of have like barricades around us and people around us making sure that the public wasn't, you know, wandering on a set. Well, I'm going to actually go in there, and Rocky is shopping. He has a restaurant, and I'll just be signing autographs. In other words, being Rocky and just shooting like a live film, it became mayhem. Absolute mayhem. Sly would be like setting up a shot and talking to his first ADs. One time this woman just walked up. I think she said to Sly, you know, it's good to see you back in the neighborhood, Rock. It's good to see you back in the neighborhood. And then she just walked off. And Sly didn't miss a beat. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's good to see you too. Yeah, you look great. And then he turned around and just kept going back to, you know, everything that we were working on. For audiences and reviewers, Rocky Balboa was a winner. It earned over $155 million worldwide. Stallone somehow enchants them with this admission that, like the rest of us, he's, he's getting older, that his glory days are behind him, and he touches another chord all of us respond to. This was an attempt to sort of return to the beginning. This was the redemption movie. It was just a minor miracle. Really, it was a minor miracle. Stallone and his boxer had surprised the critics. With a new twist on his original plotline, Rocky had gone out on top and so had his creator. And I think there's something about the willingness to continue to fight and continue to fight it and try to get, get it done right is inherent in Stallone. Just doesn't give up as a real battler. I thought it was true, it was honest. I didn't know how big it was gonna be, but I knew it was gonna be a great movie and I thought it was one of the best movies I ever did. 35 years after Rocky first appeared, and five years after his final curtain call, audiences still want to know what happens next. Stallone insists that Rocky Balboa will be the last installment in the franchise. But there is at least one more Rocky project in the pipeline. I know that they have announced the Rocky musical, yes. He was intent on seeing a stage production made. It's something that's been on his mind for a long time. Movies are kind of passe now. It's musicals we care about. 
35 years on, Rocky is still timeless. The pictures have always been shown on cable TV around the world. There's not a moment in time, probably, when there's not a Rocky playing somewhere in the world, including this very minute. We made a tremendous impact. Rocky movies are very inspirational to people. I've talked to a lot of fighters that they said, uh, after I saw Rocky, I would be a fighter. In the end, Stallone and his character have become inextricably linked. The star and his creation. It's a drug. It's such a wonderful all-American high. If you're sitting home and it comes on, you just keep watching it. Rocky has stood the test of time. Everyone has a Rocky in them. That's what has kept it going. It's certainly not me. It's their own inner Rocky. Two lives woven into one. I remember one day I kind of glanced over and saw Sly standing in the corner. And then I see his whole face change. I guess this really slow look in his eye. He went from Sly to Rocky in, you know, a matter of moments. It's been this extraordinary ride to be able to have gone through all these films. But it ain't about how hard you hit. I think that the movie's parallels life. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Sly Stallone's real-life struggle made the on-screen story that much richer, that much better. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. He came essentially out of nowhere. Go up. Show shot. Do your show shot. Why do you want to fight? Because I can't sing or dance. Hey, yo. I was wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind marrying me very much. Don't worry about nothing. You just sleep as long as you want, OK? Because <laughs> I'm going to be here when you wake up. Would you be interested in fighting Apollo Creed for the World Heavyweight Championship? Oh, what is that? His success just kept growing and growing and growing along with the character. of someone who was a loser, who had the guts, stamina, and strength of character to come back the way he did, is something that a lot of people can relate to. Ladies and gentlemen, go for it. In the ring and in real life, Rocky and Stallone. As much as I like to say, well, Rocky the character, it's me. I mean, it's basically who I am in a lot of ways, because you can't fake it for 30-some years. It's a message of endurance and heart. Come and get it. Come on, Come on. Come on.